In this program, we meet political figures at the heart of the issues shaping our world. In today's show, I'll be talking to a long-time political activist born under apartheid in South Africa. He has said, the legacy of apartheid is alive and well. The struggle against apartheid, racism, racialism and discrimination has not ended and can never end until a just social order is established. What has been your impression? I mean, because we just heard from the quote there, you say the legacy of apartheid is still with us. But what has been your impression of the current situation in South Africa since what uh, some describe as so-called liberation? The term so-called liberation, liberation is quite accurate because uh, nobody has been liberated, neither the oppressed people nor the oppressor. When you strike a compromise between the oppressor and the oppressed, something has gone wrong. And that was reflected in what was lauded as a good chance to have reconciliation, which was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Ironically, 22,000 people turned blacks appeared before the commission and very few of the oppressors, mm -hmm. um, the majority of the whites. Yes. What was also very disappointing was the fact that the people who orchestrated the apartheid terrorist regime, not just the apartheid regime, because they terrorized not only the 40 million indigenous people, but also the surrounding African states. And neither the Bruderbond, which was established in 1918 as a secret organization, was subpoenaed by the TRC, mm. neither the judiciary your magistrates, judges and prosecutors who implemented the apartheid laws, nor the multinational companies who benefited the most from apartheid. Mm -hmm. And of course, the politicos like uh, ex-president P.W. Buerta, but who what, were responsible would, for these. What would, what would you say, Imam, to people who still see people like Nelson Mandela as heroes and see him as a source of inspiration? Do you feel that he was an integral part of the compromise or was he hoodwinked to a certain degree? No, he wasn't hoodwinked. Uh, in his case in 1964, when he appeared in court, he made a statement which was later quoted in the financial uh, mail and other business uh, magazines that he has never ever been opposed to uh, capitalism and that was the cue. So they already started trying to get him on board so they softened yeah. him up and that was the reason for removing him from other comrades on the island who were in the Ravonia trial. Um, accidentally I bumped into uh, the second in command of MK and that's Mkonto Wesizwe. Mkonto Wesizwe mm -hmm. and uh, he called me and he mistook me for somebody else for an MK member which I've never been and he said to me uh, Ismail which is not my name if they think they can strike a deal with Nelson Mandela and leave us out they are making a big mistake mm -hmm. so already there was a split which was observable right that they knew that Nelson Mandela had been taken off the island in order to set in process the negotiations. Okay. So that came as no surprise. Well, looking at the current administration under Zuma, would you say that is a continuation of the same line of thinking? No, there's a big difference uh, between Zuma. Zuma was on Robben Island for 10 years. Nelson Mandela was there for 18 years. And we'd just like to correct an historical error which says that he was on Robben Island for 27 years. That's mm -hmm. not true. The oldest serving political prisoner on Robben Island was, in fact, Jeff Masimula, who spent 27 years there. And he was, in fact, assassinated in what was called a motor car accident shortly after he was released. 
So he definitely was the longest uh, serving prisoner on Robben Island. And he was a member of the Pan-Africanist Congress that, of Azania, yes? That is yes? correct, a very staunch okay. member who had received life imprisonment way back in 1963. Right. So Nelson Mandela obviously uh, was the key to bringing about the changes. And a lot of the deals that took place, both in Lusaka and London, were directly uh, related to him and involved him when I was in Polsma prison uh, way back in the 80s, that would have been around about 86, I was arrested and held in detention. Uh, we saw Nelson Mandela leaving the prison complex dressed in a suit. And of course, later on, we discovered that these meetings were with Kubi Kutsi, um, one of the cabinet ministers. Mm -hmm. So obviously later on they confirmed that and even meetings with the head of intelligence, Dr. Neil Barnett and others. Mm -hmm. So it was a long process which started way back in 1982. And uh, of course you had the Dakar conference and other feelers that were sent out. Yeah. But it was very well orchestrated. Yes. Um, the people who needed the settlement badly were in fact the multinational companies, the financiers, the banks, the investors. Mm -hmm because the country obviously was going down a very slippery economic slope. Mm -hmm. uh, they got them on board. Why did they choose the ANCs? Because the ANC has always been very comfortable with the concept multi-racism. And I found it ironical that even Nelson Mandela, uh, on two occasions, one is a set of uh, essays written by Robben Island prisoners, and edited by Mac Maharaj called Reflections uh, from Robben Island. And the first essay is by Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And in there he still refers to people as coloreds and as blacks and Africans. Mm -hmm. um, when he was at Wembley shortly after his release, he says the ANC is a non-racial organization, therefore all races are welcome. Right. Now, that obviously is conceptual confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our top thinkers in South Africa, when they say, when we called ourselves Africans, we meant that we were anti-racist. And right. very few people have used the concept anti-racism. We also draw a distinction between racism and racialism. Mm -hmm. Racism is based on statutes, on law, and it's enforced by the police, the courts, and eventually the army. Whereas racialism is when you and I discriminate against each other on whatever flimsy reason. And the fact that it is still very much part of South African life is the BEE, Black Economic Empowerment, and affirmative action. And also the outbreaks of xenophobia just consolidates that particular viewpoint that racism and racialism is alive and well in South Africa.